Uh, thank you, everybody. We will now reconvene the ACIP meeting um, and move to our next session. Uh, our first presenter today will be Dr. Um, Evelyn Twentyman, who will present on um, the evidence recommendations, Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted in adults 18 and older. So Dr. Twentyman. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon, all. Today, let's walk through our evidence to recommendations framework as it pertains to the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted as a primary series in adults ages 18 years and older. Next slide, please. Thank you. Let's start with the mechanism of action of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, which is the first protein subunit COVID-19 vaccine authorized in the United States. mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, including those of Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna on the left, and the viral vector Janssen, j, j vaccine on the right, both use genetic material to encode a SARS-CoV-2 viral antigen and induce an immune response to that antigen. In contrast, adjuvanted protein subunit vaccines like Novavax COVID-19 vaccine use the viral antigen without any genetic material and with an adjuvant added to help induce a strong immune response. Next slide, please. Novavax COVID-19 vaccine includes a purified full-length stable recombinant spike protein as the viral antigen and uses matrix M adjuvant to enhance the magnitude of the immune response to the spike protein. T helper cells then recognize this spike protein as a viral antigen, and these T helper cells stimulate B cells to produce neutralizing antibodies to this viral antigen and help protect the vaccine recipient against COVID-19. Next slide, please. Our, power, our policy question today is, should the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, two doses, five micrograms antigen and 50 micrograms matrix M adjuvant, intravascularly 21 days apart, be recommended for persons 18 years of age and older under an emergency use authorization. Next slide, please. Our PICO question considers as our population, people ages 18 years and older, our intervention is a two-dose primary series vaccination with Novavax COVID-19 vaccine with those doses given 21 days apart, our comparison is with no vaccine, and outcomes of interest include symptomatic laboratory confirmed COVID-19, hospitalization due to COVID-19, death due to COVID-19, asymptomatic infection, serious adverse events, and reactive immunity. Next slide, please. We are guided by our evidence and recommendations framework, including the domains of the public health problem, which is COVID-19, benefits and harms of the intervention, which is the Novavax vaccine given as a primary series to adults, Values, which help us to assess whether the target population feels the desirable effects are large relative to undesirable effects, acceptability of the intervention to key stakeholders, feasibility of implementation, and the impact of the intervention on health equity. Next slide. First, we'll consider the public health problem. In this section, we'll be considering both the magnitude of the public health problem and how COVID-19 vaccines in general are protecting people from this problem in terms of reducing the risk of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths due to COVID-19. Next slide, please. COVID-19 continues to pose a significant threat to public health in the US. As of July 14th, there have been over 83 million cases of COVID-19 in the United States. Next slide. COVID-19 vaccines continue to mitigate the burden of COVID-19 cases. In June of 22, uh, unvaccinated people ages five and older, including both children and adults, had 2.8 times higher risk of testing positive for COVID-19 compared, to people, un to, compared to people vaccinated with at least a primary series. Next slide, please. COVID-19 associated hospitalizations also continue, and unfortunately, recently are on the rise. The burden of COVID-19 associated hospitalization is significantly higher among adults ages 18 and over as compared to children ages 17 years and younger. Next slide, please. COVID-19 vaccines continue to reduce the risk of COVID-19 associated hospitalization for vaccine recipients. In May of 2022, unvaccinated adults ages 18 years and older had three and a half times higher risk of COVID-19 associated hospitalization compared with people who had completed their primary series and at least one booster dose. Next slide, please. Tragically, as we all know, COVID-19 continues to kill. As of July 14th, 1,018,578 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 in the United States. 
and that is 1,018,578 too many. More than 99% of these people were ages 18 years and older, the population under our consideration today. Next slide, please. Fortunately, we've seen that COVID-19 vaccines continue to mitigate the risk of COVID-19 mortality for those who get vaccinated. In May of 2022, unvaccinated people ages five and older had a six times higher risk of dying from COVID-19 compared to people who had received a primary series. Next slide, please. Then if we look at risk of mortality among a slightly older age group, those ages 12 and older who have had a booster recommendation in place for a longer time, we see that unvaccinated people ages 12 and up had nine times higher risk of dying from COVID-19 compared to those with a primary series completed and a booster dose as well. Next slide, please. As you can see over this graph of daily trends and doses of vaccines administered with the y-axis marked in millions, we've been fortunate to have some outstanding success in getting hundreds of millions of COVID-19 vaccine doses administered across the US overall. Next slide, please. There are still important opportunities to improve vaccination rates, particularly among people ages 18 to 49, as you see here. In this group, less than 70% are fully vaccinated with a primary series, and less than 30% are up to date with our COVID-19 vaccinations. Coverage does appear to improve with increasing age. I did wanna to mention too that this slide helps speak to the question raised earlier about who has received booster doses among those eligible. And certainly being up to date is the most effective thing you can do as an individual to protect yourself against COVID-19. The first step towards that, of course, is completing a primary series vaccination. Next slide, please. When we look at this data in another way, by percent of people with at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine since these vaccines first became available, we can see here too that we are struggling more to complete vaccine coverage among young adult populations in particular. Note too that this describes percent of each of these age groups receiving a single dose, not percent of these age groups who are up to date with their COVID-19 vaccine. We do have opportunities to improve our vaccine coverage. Next slide, please. COVID-19 continues to pose a significant health problem. In summary, COVID-19 vaccines continue to mitigate cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, but not all people in the U.S. have received the benefits that COVID-19 vaccines provide. In fact, about 26 to 37 million U.S. adults have not yet received a single dose of a COVID-19 vaccine and would benefit from starting a primary series. Next slide, please. In this context, the ACIP COVID-19 workgroup unanimously considered COVID-19 disease among adults ages 18 years and older to be of public health importance. Next slide, please. Let's now move toward benefits and harms. Next slide, please. ACIP and CDC developed vaccine recommendations using an explicit evidence-based method based on the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation, or grade, approach. One study provided data used in the grade evidence synthesis. This was the Novavax phase three randomized controlled trial, uh, otherwise known as study 301, and the data were obtained directly from the sponsor for the purposes of this analysis. These data did not include the six hospitalizations and one death occurring in the placebo group as mentioned by the sponsor earlier today. The data cutoff date was September 27, 2021, with a median placebo controlled follow-up of 2.5 months. Study enrollment and efficacy follow-up occurred during December 27, 2020 to September 27, 2021, and mainly when the alpha variant of SARS-CoV-2 was predominant. A total of 29,945 adults were randomized two to one to receive either the vaccine or saline placebo. The numbers of persons available for the analysis in the full analysis set, which was used to assess serious adverse events, and the per-protocol set, which was used for most efficacy analyses, are shown on the slide. Next slide, please. Using the per protocol population for all persons ages at least 18 years, there were 17 cases among the 17,272 persons in the vaccine arm and 79 among the 8,335, sorry, 385 persons in the placebo arm. 
which resulted in a vaccine efficacy estimate of 89.6%, with a 95% confidence interval of 82.4 to 93.8%. This is the outcome used for grade. Next slide, please. Vaccine efficacy was also at least 75% in various subgroups, including those aged 65 years and older, and those at risk due to presence of a comorbidity. Next slide. To provide supportive data for effectiveness in persons ages 65 years and older, in whom there were few events, this slide shows an immunogenicity comparison between the participants ages 50 to 64 years, who demonstrated a BE of 90.7%, uh, with a range of 73 to 97 in confidence intervals in a post hoc efficacy analysis to those ages 65 years and older. The day 35 neutralizing antibody GMT was slightly lower for ages 65 years and older compared with those ages 50 to 64 years with a GMT ratio of 0.91. The lower bound of the associated 95% confidence interval would have met FDA's usual success criterion for immunobridging, for immunobridging non-inferiority, which is greater than 0.67. Next slide, please. Vaccine efficacy of approximately 90% and higher was observed across racial and ethnic groups, with the exception of Hispanic or Latino participants, in whom a vaccine efficacy of 75.7% with a confidence interval from 46 to 89% was observed. Next slide, please. We will now talk about the grade assessment for the outcome of symptomatic laboratory confirmed COVID-19. The relative risk was 0.1 with a 95% confidence interval from 0.06 to 0.18. The absolute risk demonstrated in the trial was 848 fewer cases per 100,000. In the past, we've relied on the relative effects more heavily because risk varied substantially from trial to trial. However, as we move toward a longer term vaccination strategy, we will be talking about these absolute risks more. For this outcome, there were no serious concerns in the certainty assessment and the evidence type was high certainty or type one data. Next slide, please. The second outcome for consideration was hospitalization for COVID-19. In addition to hospitalization due to COVID-19, the protocol included a definition of severe COVID-19 with criteria shown on the slide. So this did not require hospitalization. Next slide, please. This slide shows analyses of both severe COVID-19 using the protocol definition and hospitalization for COVID-19. There were no hospitalizations for COVID-19 in either the vaccine or placebo groups of which we were aware. So for the outcome of severe COVID-19, there were no cases in the vaccine group and four in the placebo group uh, for a VE of 100%. So again, this uses a surrogate of severe disease because there were no hospitalization events of which we were aware. Next slide, please. For the outcome of hospitalization due to COVID-19 assessed with a surrogate measure of severe COVID-19, the measure of effects were calculated using a standard 0.5 offset because there were no events in the vaccine group. Using this method, the relative risk was 0.05 with a 95% confidence interval from zero to one. Absolute risk was 45 fewer cases per 100,000 with a 95% confidence interval from 48 fewer to zero fewer. There was a serious concern for indirectness because severe COVID-19 is a surrogate outcome for hospitalization due to COVID-19. There was also serious concern for imprecision due to the small number of events. The final evidence type was low certainty or type three data. Next slide. For the outcome of series adverse events, there were 199 events among 19,735 participants in the vaccine group and 108 events in 9,847 events in the placebo group. For a comparison of 1% experiencing, experiencing SAEs in the vaccine group compared to 1.1% in the placebo group. Five participants in the vaccine arm experienced series adverse events that were considered potentially related to vaccination. Among these, FDA considered one event of angioedema as potentially related to vaccination. There was one event of myocarditis in the 67-year-old male with concomitant COVID-19 infection 28 days after dose one, which was not considered related to vaccination, but rather to COVID-19. Additional cases of myocarditis were observed after placebo crossover. Next slide, please. For the great assessment of the outcome of serious adverse events, we have observed a relative risk of 0.92 with a confidence interval from 0.73 to 
to 1.16. The relative risk was 88 fewer SAEs per 100,000 with a confidence interval from 296 fewer to 175 more. There were no serious concerns in the certainty assessment and the final evidence type was high certainty or type one. Next slide, please. So the outcome of severe reactive genicity, 16.3% of vaccine recipients experienced grade three or four local or systemic reactions after either dose compared to 4% in the placebo group. Next slide, please. For the grade assessment of this outcome, the relative risk of reactive genicity was 4.11 with a 95% confidence interval from 3.7 to 4.57. Absolute risk was 12,323 more per 100,000 with a confidence interval from 10,698 to 14,146 more. There were no serious concerns in the certainty assessment and evidence type was high certainty or type one. Next slide, please. In summary, by grade analysis, Novavax COVID-19 vaccine is effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 during a period of alpha variant predominance with an evidence type of one. Severe COVID-19 was used as a surrogate for the outcome of hospitalization due to COVID-19. Novavax COVID-19 vaccine demonstrated efficacy in preventing severe COVID-19, but the evidence type was three. Series adverse events were balanced between the vaccine and placebo arm with an evidence type of one. Finally, severe reactions were more common among the vaccinated with any grade three or higher uh, reactive genicity reported in 16.3% of vaccinated versus 4% of placebo recipients. The evidence type for reactive genicity was one. Next slide, please. We'll now move toward considering additional information to assess the vaccine efficacy and safety. As we do this, we'll move beyond the data considered through the great approach, which you just heard discussed, and include now some additional evidence to inform our evidence recommendations framework. With respect to efficacy, we'll include observations we have regarding circulating variants across the duration of the pandemic and observations of efficacy in the context of other variants. Toward the strongest possible evaluation of safety, we'll look at data pertaining to both pre and post crossover vaccine recipients in 301, plus adolescent and booster expansions of 301, and all vaccine recipients across Novavax clinical trials globally, including 302, 501, and 101, in addition to 301. To better understand myocarditis and or pericarditis after Novavax, we'll look at this broader safety set and we'll consider publicly available post-authorization data globally to allow us to learn from the experience of other countries with Novavax. Next slide, please. <laughs> Let's start by describing some of our remaining questions about vaccine efficacy, including VE in certain populations. VE against asymptomatic infection and VE in the context of the crime. Next slide, please. <clears throat> First, we observed that Novavax vaccine efficacy, as assessed in study 301, was assessed in the period of predominance of the alpha variant of SARS CoV 2. We know this both from the time in which case occurred occurred and from the time, uh, and sorry, from the sequence data obtained over the course of case accrual. Nine cases occurred. 75 had sequence data with 53% 50, with of these sequences alpha, which you'll see depicted in the darker teal inverted triangle on the upper left of the viral lineage plot. We'll also see that 3% of these sequences were beta and 1% delta. Next slide, please. Now let's start to explore why variant circulation might matter in our assessment of benefits of a COVID-19 vaccine. First, in, neutral, in neutralizing antibody studies assessing the immune response of people who received mRNA vaccines, we can see here that the sera from study participants who completed their second dose of the mRNA vaccines due to six weeks earlier mounted a weaker neutralizing antibody response against many variants as compared with alpha and ancestral lineages in gold and blue on the left. For Omicron sublineages specifically, on the right in teal, neutralizing titers were much lower compared with alpha and ancestral strains. Next slide, please. Let's now move out of the lab and into real world vaccine effectiveness studies. First, look at estimates for vaccine effectiveness from CDC's vision network against hospitalization for two doses of mRNA vaccines during the period 
that are alpha predominance on the left in blue diamonds at approximately 90% for both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. You'll see that these estimates were the same in the period of delta predominance where the red circles indicate combined two-dose mRNA VE. However, <coughs> you'll notice a marked drop in the period of Omicron BA1 predominance down to just under 70% shown in gray triangles. And then another drop in the era of Omicron BA2 and BA2.12.1 to less than 60% shown in light blue circles. Next slide, please. So thus far, we've discussed what we know about variations in immune response as assessed by neutralizing antibody studies in the context of different SARS-CoV-2 variants, and discuss what we've seen in real-world vaccine effectiveness over the periods of predominance of different variances, both in the context of mRNA vaccines. But let's now return to Novavax COVID-19 vaccines. <coughs> we do have one study that investigated the efficacy of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine against the beta variant during its predominance in South Africa. Here, we saw vaccine efficacy against symptomatic COVID-19 disease of 49.4% and slightly higher efficacy among participants who are HIV negative. And we know that most sequence isolates from cases accrued during the study were beta variants. And in a post hoc analysis, vaccine efficacy against beta was 51% with wide common intervals crossing zero. All this is really just to say that we do not yet know what exactly the vaccine effectiveness of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine will be in the context of Omicron or in the context of future variants. Next slide, please. Let's transition now to um, look at our broader safety data set in discussion of any possible harms. Most importantly, we'd like to discuss several events of myocarditis and or pericarditis with possible relationships to vaccine detected over the expanded safety data set of approximately 41,546 recipients aged 16 years and older. There were two other events identified as impossible relationships to vaccine over all recipients, including one event of angioedema in study 301 as previously discussed, and one event of Guillain Barre in study 302 also as previously discussed. Let's now do a deep dive into the events of myocarditis and or pericarditis identified. Next slide, please. It's really important to contextualize these events of myocarditis and or pericarditis. Uh, we know that intensive post-authorization COVID-19 vaccine surveillance has identified a small risk of myocarditis associated with mRNA vaccination, particularly after a second dose in adolescent males and young women. We also know that COVID-19, uh, sorry, COVID-19 disease itself is associated with risk of multiple serious cardiac outcomes, including myocarditis, pericarditis, stroke, acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, heart failure, arrhythmia, and cardiac death. Next slide, please. In this context, it is very, very clear that benefits of COVID-19 vaccine outweigh risk. The risk of cardiac complications is higher after COVID-19 than after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination among males and females of all ages. Teen boys, and who we know myocarditis uh, risk is higher, have two to six times the risk of cardiac complications after infection compared to after vaccination. And young men ages 18 to 29 have seven to eight times the risk of cardiac complications after infection compared to after vaccination. COVID-19 vaccine is the best way to protect against COVID-19 and rare cardiac complications. Next slide, please. Let's now just briefly review what we know about myocarditis and or pericarditis after mRNA vaccination from two of the platforms that make up the most intensive vaccine safety surveillance in U.S. history. First, let's consider what we know from the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, or VAERS. VAERS is a nation's early warning system for vaccine safety. It accepts reports from everyone, regardless of plausibility of the vaccine having caused the event or the seriousness of the event. This slide shows reporting rates of myocarditis and or pericarditis following mRNA vaccination from this platform. By age group and sex, you can see the highest reporting rate of 38.9 is among 18 to 24 year old males following dose two and within zero to seven days of vaccination. And 
Only where you see bolded numbers here, do reporting rates exceed the estimated background incidence of myocarditis. Next slide, please. From vaccine safety data link, otherwise known as VSD, um, which is a collaborative project between CDC and nine integrated healthcare organizations, um, we're, we're able to assess both the safety of COVID-19 vaccines on a weekly basis using increased specified outcomes of interest as you heard earlier, and to describe the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines over time by age, site, race, and, and ethnicity. These data also demonstrate excess risk among young people following those two with excess cases in risk period per million doses reflected in the far right column here. Next slide, please. Now let's turn to what we saw in the Novavax clinical trials. In the total clinical safety database of over 40,000 vaccine recipients, four cases were identified as having a temporal relationship to vaccination and concerns for causal relationship to the vaccine. All four patients were hospitalized, and all four of these patients experienced complete clinical resolution. There were three additional cases identified across clinical trials, two in vaccine recipients and one in a placebo recipient, all with alternative explanations for etiology. Next slide, please. Myocarditis and pericarditis ha have also been identified in international post-marketing survey, uh, sorry, safety data. To date, over 744,000 doses have been administered in the countries uh, and in the European Union as listed here. These data were submitted uh, by the sponsor to FDA in advance, in advance of their consideration of the BRF Act meeting on June 7, 2022. Next slide, please. Internationally, 35 unique reports, including 36 unique myocarditis and or pericarditis events, have been identified. There were 29 cases of pericarditis, and notably, Five of these individuals with pericarditis had a history of pericarditis following mRNA vaccination. There were also four cases of myocarditis, two cases of myopericarditis, and one case of carditis not otherwise specified. The median known age of patients was 35 years, with uh, 20 males and 15 females identified. Next slide, please. This table summarizes what it summarizes what is known about myocarditis and pericarditis following Novavax in clinical trials uh, and post marketing data so far. The first row reflects the clinical trials data with four to six cases identified following vaccines out of 41,546 doses administered in people ages 16 years and older for a reporting rate of 96 to 144 cases per million doses. Row two shows us the 36 cases reported in post marketing data resulting in a reporting rate of 48 per million doses. And the last row shows data from Australia post-marketing reports, 15 cases out of 160,000 doses for a rate of 94 per million doses as described on the public facing Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration website. Next slide, please. In FDA's EUA fact sheet for providers, a warning about myopericarditis reads clinical trial data provide evidence for increased risk myocarditis and pericarditis following the administration of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted. The EUA fact sheet for recipients cautions recipients to tell vaccine providers about a history of myocarditis or pericarditis and also counsels what symptoms to watch for. Next slide. So in summary, Novavax COVID-19 vaccine had high efficacy in the setting of the alpha variant. Uh, consistent with other, with other authorized COVID-19 vaccines at that time. The efficacy with recent SARS-CoV-2 variants and future variants is unknown. Reactogenicity reported after a Novavax vaccine was similar to what has been reported for other COVID-19 vaccine primary series. We did receive reports of myocarditis and or pericarditis after Novavax COVID-19 vaccine during clinical trials, and uh, several cases are evident in early post-authorization. Based on our available data, it's important to say we cannot directly compare vaccine efficacy or myocarditis rates for Novavax and mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. Post-authorization monitoring for both vaccine effectiveness and safety will be important moving forward. Next slide, please. Based on these data, the working group uh, felt that the 
desir desirable anticipated effects of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine were large. Next slide, please. They felt that the undesirable and anticipated effects were small. Next slide, please. And that in the balance, uh, desirable effects outweighed und undesirable effects favoring the intervention, that is to say, the note effects. Next slide. Let's turn now to discuss value. Next slide. A survey designed by CDC and University of Iowa and RAND Corporation to assess vaccination intentions for protein-based COVID-19 vaccine with or without adjuvant among unvaccinated Americans collected data from January 27th through February 2nd, 2022, with a sample size of 541 respondents. Today, we'll focus on the vaccination intentions for a, intentions for a protein-based COVID-19 vaccine with adjuvant, such as Novavax. COVID-19 vaccine among unvaccinated adults. Next slide, please. 16% of these unvaccinated respondents said that they would probably or definitely get an adjuvanted protein-based COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. However, 52% of these unvaccinated respondents said that they probably or definitely would not get an adjuvanted uh, protein-based COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. These results did vary somewhat by several dem demographic characteristics, but not by others. Vaccine intentions were significantly higher among men than among women, and vaccine intentions were significantly lower among non-Hispanic white adults than among non-Hispanic black adults or among Hispanic adults, as you see here. Vaccine intentions did not vary by U.S. region, metropolitan status, age, or education. Next slide. In another survey conducted June 18th through 23rd of 2022, among a representative sample of 1,788 unvaccinated U.S. adults, some unvaccinated groups were less adamantly against uh, traditional uh, vaccines than others. In other words, uh, more long-standing platforms than others. Those in urban areas, adults under 35, and Black and Hispanic adults were all less likely than the average unvaccinated American to say that they would skip a traditional protein-based vaccine. Next slide, please. Here, we're presenting the top concerns among unvaccinated adults who do not want protein-based COVID-19 vaccines. Side effects were the main concern, followed by worries that the vaccine moves through clinical trials too fast and or a belief that the vaccine won't be effective. Next slide, please. The survey also detected a very interesting difference in beliefs about safety in protein-based vaccines versus mRNA vaccines. You'll see on this top row that overall, among all adults, these assessments of safety were similar, but interestingly, vaccinated adults seem to more commonly express the belief that mRNA vaccines were safer, safer while unvaccinated adults seem to more commonly believe that protein subunit vaccines were safe, safer. Next slide. So in summary, when asked in early 2022, 16% of unvaccinated respondents probably or definitely would get an adjuvanted protein-based COVID-19 vaccine like Novavax. However, 52% of these unvaccinated respondents said that they probably or definitely would not. There were no significant differences by U.S. region, metropolitan status, age group, or education, but vaccine intentions were lower for females than males uh, and lower for non-Hispanic white adults. 77% of unvaccinated adults, unfortunately, said they wouldn't get a traditional protein-based COVID-19 vaccine if one were authorized. Uh, however, among unvaccinated adults, 28% said they view these traditional or more longstanding protein-based vaccines as safe compared to 17% who said mRNA shots or vaccines were safe. Next slide, please. The work group felt that the desirable effects um, in terms of their view within the target population were varied, uh, that patients and caregiver uh, views would vary, and that the evaluation of uh, this intervention um, varied. Next slide, please. Additionally, 
uh, the work group felt that there was probably important uncertainty or variability in this valuation. Next slide. Moving to the next domain, let's consider acceptability. Next slide, please. Let's first discuss the most significant apparent influences upon an individual's assessment of vaccine acceptability as assessed by a Kaiser Found Family Foundation survey. Personal doctors are most trusted for COVID-19 vaccine information, with survey respondents' own doctor most frequently ascribed a great deal or a fair amount of trust with pediatricians following next. Next slide, please. CDC is investing in a variety of diverse partnerships to work to enhance the acceptability of vaccines across the nation, including in investing in jurisdictions to launch new programs to enhance access, acceptance, and uptake in communities hard hit by COVID-19, in health departments to address COVID-19 disparities, in community health worker organizations, and in partnership with the federal retail pharmacy program to ensure vaccine access. Next slide, please. In a listening session conducted with jurisdictions earlier in July, most of these partners stated that they would order Novavax vaccine if it became available, expressed a high interest in support related to Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, and described highly varied intent of use, including in private provider offices, pharmacies, local health departments, and all of the above. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, the great majority of adults, 85% trust their own doctors to provide reliable information about COVID-19 vaccines. The CDC will continue to do everything CDC can to enhance vaccine uh, acceptability, access and uptake in communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and elsewhere. And as with other COVID-19 vaccines, Novavax COVID-19 vaccine is likely to be acceptable to implementing partners. Next slide, please. Overall, the work group felt that the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine was probably acceptable to key stakeholders. Next slide, please. Turning down to feasibility, next slide, please. We'll consider our standard known barriers to vaccine implementation here, including complexity of recommendations and communication thereof, vaccine storage and handling requirements, financial barriers, and Barriers. Next slide. When it comes to complexity of recommendations, the important note here does not pertain to Novavax COVID 19 per se, but to the complexity of the many vaccine recommendations it comes alongside as potentially the fourth approved COVID 19 vaccine in the US. Next slide, please. Uh, we know that this vaccine is supplied in a carton containing 10 multiple dose vials, with, with each vial containing 10 doses each. Um, this is stored in the refrigerator, cannot be frozen, again, does not need to be frozen, uh, and has a um, beyond use date of six hours after first puncture, so it has to be discarded shortly thereafter. Um, and the vaccine is preservative free, does not require reconstitution or dilution. Next slide, please. Uh, there, there is an interesting factor here that pertains to the expiration date. To find these dates because they are not on the label, uh, partners need to navigate to www.novavaxcovidvaccine.com. Next slide, please. A finance, in the realm of financial barriers, COVID-19 vaccines continue to be provided to populations free of charge. Uh, just to note that health systems or health departments do incur some costs for vaccine implementation, so makes outreach and education, and financial hardship can arise if vaccine recipients have to take time off to receive the vaccine or end up having to take time off afterwards. Next slide, please. And uh, in supply barriers, we've demonstrated in the US that uh, distribution of vaccine per se is feasible to implement broadly. Uh, the purchase of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine thus far includes 3.2 million doses with intent to distribute following ACIP recommendation if indeed recommended. Next slide, please. Here is a little list of pros and cons. Some relative logistic advantages of the Novavax vaccine include easy storage, familiar schedule, and easy preparation. The disadvantages uh, in terms of feasibility might include that short seal beyond use date time that need to discard after puncture. Additionally, there are no recommendations for unrefrigerated storage prior to puncture, um, 10 dose packaging, and just the fact that this is a new 
on a product for providers. Next slide, please. In summary, uh, Novavax would be the fourth COVID-19 vaccine with an EUA. Uh, all vaccines will continue to be provided free of charge. Uh, we have shown uh, success in, in distributing about 6 million doses, 600 million doses of, of COVID-19 vaccine across the US. This is excellent. Uh, we've reviewed some rel relative and fiscal advantages of Novavax and a few uh, disadvantages as well. Next slide, please. Overall, the work group felt uh, that Novavax COVID-19 vaccine would indeed be feasible to implement among adults ages 18 years and older as a primary series. Next slide, please. Now let's turn to equity, an ETR domain of really uh, most importance to, to all of us here. Next slide, please. The burden of the most severe COVID-19 outcomes has weighed more heavily on some populations than on others. These inequities are seen in the um, seen as a manifestation of longstanding inequities and are also unfortunately a contributor to continued and future inequities. We all, all of us here, let's call all of us here in the US in general, need to do everything we can to reduce health inequities. And this is really fundamental to those of us working in public health and in clinical medicine. We know that no single vaccine has the ability to overcome all disparities. Um, neither the vaccine under discussion today nor any other single vaccine. But we will discuss several issues related to vaccine equity here today and health equity in this section. And just note that it's critical to continue to investigate these persistent health inequities and do everything in our power to resolve them. And to underscore that any inequity in COVID-19 vaccine access or use has the potential to further exacerbate disparities in COVID-19 impacts. Next slide, please. We've discussed this slide earlier today, but just to state again, because it's important to note, we see really powerful cumulative inequities and the higher risk of hospitalization with COVID-19 among American Indian or Alaskan Native non-Hispanic persons, Black African American non-Hispanic persons, and Hispanic or Latino persons as compared to white non-Hispanic persons. And even worse, the higher risk of death due to COVID-19 among these same populations. We are continuing to work together to resolve injustices like these. Um, this shows us you know, where we are today. This shows us the cumulative effects thus far. Um, and I think it's important to take this time to turn toward the future. Given the power of COVID-19 vaccines to reduce the risk of these severe outcomes, COVID-19 vaccines represent a potential way to decrease these disparities over time. If distribution, access, acceptance, or uptake of COVID-19 vaccine is equitable, however, we might not see the intended effect of vaccines on these disparities. Next slide, please. Thus far, inequities do unfortunately persist in receipt of COVID-19 vaccines. Data from our National Immunization Survey demonstrate that 22% of persons of other or multiple races, 20% of persons who are American Indian or Alaskan Native, and 14% of persons who are Hispanic, uh, and 14% of persons who are white have yet to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. Data pertaining to other disparities might also show us when we have room to improve COVID-19 vaccination. As we see here, significantly more adults residing in a rural area have not received the COVID-19 vaccine compared to those residing in suburban or urban areas. Next slide. Additionally, unfortunately, a higher percentage of adults with incomes less than 75,000 per year or living in poverty have not yet received the COVID-19 vaccine compared to adults with higher incomes. Next slide, please. Other markers of access to healthcare are unfortunately also still significant. A higher percentage of US adults who don't have a regular primary care provider or health insurance have not received a COVID-19 vaccine compared to those with a regular provider and those who are insured. These disparities are important to note, particularly in the context of COVID-19 vaccines having been made available free of charge and without the need for either primary care physician or health insurance. Just saying that we might have more to learn about the barriers to COVID-19 vaccination in this space. Next slide, please. One of the ways in which we continue to attempt to learn what drives these inequities is through surveys such as those you've seen earlier today. And this one, the US Census Bureau Household Pulse Survey, uh, showing us that adults would not receive a single dose of COVID-19 vaccine 
uh, tended to be younger with lower levels of educational attend attainment, more likely to be non-white, less likely to be married, more likely to be economically disadvantaged, and more likely to report a disability or a different ability than those who received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. We have more to learn and more to do. Next slide, please. In an effort to make advancements toward vaccine equity for all, uh, CDC launched the Partnering for Vaccine Equity program focused on increasing equity in adult immunization. Next slide, please. Uh, anyone who is interested in learning about these important efforts is invited to visit the uh, Partnering for Vaccine Equity Vaccine Resource Hub to learn more and to join us in these efforts. Next slide, please. In summary, there are notable disparities in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and mortality rates by race and ethnicity. Vaccine status differs by age, level of education, by race, and by ethnicity. An additional COVID-19 vaccine utilizing traditional or more long-standing vaccine technology will provide an additional option for unvaccinated individuals. But improving vaccine equity requires continued efforts. National, state, local, and community level partners are focused on diverse endeavors to improve equity in adult immunizations among disproportionately affected in population. Next slide, please. Overall, the work group felt that uh, the impact of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine alone will probably have no impact on health equity. Next slide, please. And now to summarize overall. Next slide, please. The work group felt that COVID-19 is of public health importance that the, and that the anticipated desirable effects of the vaccine were large, while anticipated undesirable effects were small. The work group felt that the balance of desirable and undesirable effects favored intervention. The certainty of evidence for critical outcomes raised from, ranged from high for prevention of symptomatic COVID-19 and serious adverse events to low for prevention of hospitalization. It was felt that the target population valuation of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine varied with probably important uncertainty or variability. It was thought that the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine was probably acceptable to key stakeholders, that it was feasible to implement, and that the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine alone would probably unfortunately have no impact on health equity. Next slide, please. The work group interpretation of data presented thus far is as follows. We see that the vaccine has high efficacy against symptomatic COVID-19 disease in the setting of alpha predominance. Uh, reports of, of myocarditis and or pericarditis after Novavax COVID-19 vaccine uh, are acknowledged during uh, both clinical trial and early post authorization data. We know that based on available data, we cannot directly compare vaccine efficacy or myocarditis rates for novel vaccinate mRNA vaccines, and that post authorization monitoring for both vaccine effectiveness and safety will be important. Vaccination remains the best way to protect against SARS CoV 2 and rare cardiac risk of COVID 19 disease. Next slide, please. As always, the top priority remains the vaccination of unvaccinated individuals. An additional COVID-19 vaccine utilizing traditional or more long-standing vaccine technology will provide an additional option for unvaccinated individuals. And overall, the work group felt that the benefits of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine outweigh risk. Next slide, please. In the balance of consequences evaluated, the work group felt that desirable consequences probably or clearly outweighed undesirable consequences in most settings. Next slide, please. And the work group did recommend the intervention. Next slide, please. With that, we're actually going to turn to Dr. Alicia Hall for a moment to guide us through what the interim clinical considerations for the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine will look like if recommended here today. Thanks, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Dr. Toyman. Uh, next slide, please. So first we'll review the Novavax schedule. Novavax is authorized for people who are ages 18 years and older, starting at the top in teal for people who are not moderately or severely immunocompromised. This group should receive two primary doses separated by three to eight weeks, and we'll talk about that eight-week extended interval later in this presentation. 
Shown in gold at the bottom is the schedule for people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised, and this group should receive two primary doses separated by three weeks. Next slide, please. Two things to draw your attention to. A third primary dose for people who are immunocompromised is not currently authorized. At this time, only the two-dose primary series is authorized for both populations. If and when a third dose is authorized, CDC could then add guidance to that effect. Additionally, just like when other COVID-19 vaccines were first authorized for a primary series, only primary doses are authorized at this time. Neither a homologous or heterologous booster is authorized. We would expect at some point in the future, people who choose this primary series would be able to get a booster when they need it. Just as a reminder, CDC provides clinical guidance for what FDA authorizes. Next slide, please. So much of the guidance I'll cover today will look familiar because we're simply extending our current guidance to include Novavax. So the first thing I'll talk about is a mixed primary series. COVID-19 vaccines are not interchangeable, including Novavax. The same vaccine product should be used for all doses in the primary series. If a mixed primary series is inadvertently administered, the series is, com is considered complete and doses don't need to be repeated. It is considered an error, though, and should be reported. Next slide, please. As an exception to this rule, if a person starts but is unable to complete the primary series with the same COVID-19 vaccine due to a contraindication, any other non-contraindicated age-appropriate COVID-19 vaccine may be administered to complete the series at a minimum of 28 days from the last dose. This would not need to be reported to VAERS because it is included in CDC's guidance. Next slide, please. Existing co-administration guidance that applies to other COVID-19 vaccines also applies to Novavax vaccine. In general, COVID-19 vaccines may be administered without regard to timing of other vaccines, so on the same day or any time before or after. And routine administration of all age-appropriate doses of vaccines simultaneously is recommended for people for whom no specific contraindications exist at the time of the healthcare visit. The only exception is that there are additional considerations for orthopox virus vaccines, and I'll talk about this in a couple slides. Next slide, please. So when deciding to co-administer another vaccine with Novavax vaccine, providers may consider whether a person is behind or at risk of becoming behind on recommended vaccines, the likelihood of the person returning, the person's risk of becoming infected with a vaccine-preventable disease, and that person's risk for severe disease if infected, and reactogenicity profile of the vaccines. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, there is one exception to co-administration guidance that is related to orthopox virus vaccination and is timely. So there's um, two different scenarios. Um, because of the observed risk for myocarditis after receipt of ACAM 2000, Moderna, Novavax, and Pfizer vaccines, and the unknown risk for myocarditis after Geneos, there are two scenarios. In the first, if a person receives an orthopox virus vaccine first, they might consider four weeks before receiving Moderna, Novavax, or Pfizer. In the second scenario, if a person instead receives Moderna, Novavax, or Pfizer first, they are then, and, the, and they are then recommended for an orthopox virus vaccines for prophylaxis in the setting of an outbreak, Administration of that orthopox virus vaccine should not be delayed because of the recent receipt of one of these COVID-19 vaccines. This is because the benefit of administering an orthopox virus vaccine as soon as possible when indicated for prophylaxis outweighs the possible risk of myocarditis by administering them too close together. Next slide, please. So now I'll briefly cover the preparation and administration for Novavax. As already covered, it's indicated for ages 18 years and older. One dose contains five micrograms of SARS-CoV-2 recombinant spike protein and 50 micrograms of adjuvant. The injection volume of one dose is 0.5 milliliters. The vaccine should not be diluted and contains 10 doses per volume. 
And as the other COVID-19 vaccines, it should be injected intramuscularly in the deltoid muscle for adults. Next slide, please. Now looking at storage, the Novavax vaccine should be stored refrigerated between two to eight Celsius. It should be removed from refrigerated storage only when ready to use. An unpunctured vial should not be stored at room temperature. Although some other COVID vaccines can be frozen, this one should not be frozen. And when punctured, the vial must be used within six hours after that first puncture. Of note, and as Dr. Twentyman mentioned, the expiration is not printed on either the vial or the carton, so it's very important to um, use that expiry date checker tool that Novavax has to avoid administering expired vaccine. Next slide, please. Now I'll transition into contraindications and precautions, but first I want to highlight some information that is going to be referenced in this section. We classify the currently authorized or approved COVID-19 vaccines into three types. The first type is mRNA vaccines. This includes both Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech. The second type is adenovirus vector, which includes only Janssen. And the third type is protein subunit, which includes only Novavax. So when I say type of vaccine on the following slides, these are the, the, the three distinct types I'm referring to. Next slide, please. So the contraindications will look familiar to the existing guidance for other COVID-19 vaccines. Contraindications include a history of severe allergic reaction after a previous dose or to a component of Novavax, or a history of a known diagnosed allergy to a component of Novavax. Next slide, please. So far, before Novavax, we've said that an allergy-related contraindication to one type of vaccine is a precaution to another. Now with Novavax, we've just slightly modified that language. So people with an allergy-related contraindication to one type of COVID-19 vaccine have either a contraindication or precaution to the other types. So I'll just break this down into its two pieces. Essentially, the only um, time uh, contraindication, this would be with people with a known allergy to polysorbate. They have a contraindication to both Novavax and Janssen, which contain polysorbate, and a precaution to mRNA COVID-19 vaccines only. In all other cases, an allergy-related contraindication to one type of uh, COVID-19 vaccine is a precaution to both of the other types. Next slide, please. So the other precautions are also going to look familiar um, to the existing guidance just applied to Novavax. So precautions include a history of an immediate allergic reaction to any other, um, to any vaccine other than COVID-19 vaccine or to any injectable therapy, a history of non-severe immediate allergic reaction after a dose of Novavax, moderate or severe acute illness, history of MISC or MISA, and history of myocarditis or pericarditis after a dose of an mRNA or Novavax vaccine. Next slide. So taking a closer look at myocarditis and pericarditis, this will look familiar, but just to reemphasize, myocarditis or pericarditis after a dose of an mRNA or Novavax vaccine is a precaution to a subsequent dose of any COVID-19 vaccine. Considerations for subsequent vaccination include whether the myocarditis or pericarditis was considered unrelated to mRNA or Novavax vaccination, personal risk of severe acute COVID-19, and timing of immunomodulatory therapies. For people ages 18 years and older who choose to receive a subsequent COVID-19 vaccine, some experts advise using Janssen. People who choose Janssen should be informed of the risk of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, the highest risk is in females ages 30 through 49 years. Again, much of this guidance has already been in place for mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, and we're simply extending that to Novavax. Next slide, please. Additionally, a recommendation that has already been in place and is being extended to Novavax is that a history of myocarditis or pericarditis prior to COVID-19 vaccination is not a precaution. 
People with this history may receive any currently authorized or approved COVID-19 vaccine after the episode of myocarditis or pericarditis has resolved. Next slide, please. So we'll finish up going over that extended interval between dose one and dose two, that eight week interval. So there are no specific data on an extended interval between doses one and two of Novavax. However, there is evidence of benefits of an extended interval in mRNA recipients. Some studies in adolescents and adults have shown the small risk of myocarditis or pericarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccines might be reduced and pink antibody responses and vaccine effectiveness might be increased. Therefore, an eight-week interval may be used between doses one and two to potentially reduce the risk of myocarditis or pericarditis. Next slide, please. So we've talked about this at previous meetings, but to review, the three-week interval is more appropriate for people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised, for people ages 65 years and older, and when protection needs to be achieved soonest, for example, having another high-risk reason for severe disease, or living, working, or traveling to an area with high COVID-19 community levels. Next slide. The eight-week interval could be considered for the potential to reduce myocarditis risk, especially in young adult males, and optimize vaccine effectiveness. Next slide, please. And I'd just like to acknowledge all of the folks who worked to put together the clinical considerations, as well as those that put together the clinical educational materials. And now I will hand it back over to Dr. Twentyman. Next slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. I wanted to just briefly review what the big picture of our COVID-19 vaccine recommendations will look like if this, vaccine, if this vaccine is recommended today. So for primary series vaccination, we will recommend mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, that is to say Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech, and Novavax COVID-19 vaccine. For booster vaccination, we will recommend mRNA vaccines. Note here, Novavax COVID-19 vaccines are not currently authorized for booster doses. And there is no current COVID-19 vaccine currently authorized for booster dose use in Novavax COVID-19 vaccine primary series recipients. Just like when other COVID-19 vaccines were first authorized for primary series, only primary doses are authorized at this time. Neither homologous nor heterologous booster is authorized. We would expect at some point in the future, people who choose this primary series would be able to get a booster when they need it. And then a small note, Janssen COVID-19 vaccine should only be used in limited situations, which we have uh, described at length in our interim clinical considerations. Next slide, please. This is the work of many, many hardworking individuals and teams, um, and none of this could happen without the people listed on this slide and many others across CDC, FDA, and public health. Next slide. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for those presentations. Um, the series of presentations is now open for questions. Dr. Paling, please go ahead. Okay, so first of all, I wanna say um, thank you to Dr. Twentyman and Hall for a very clear and precise uh, presentation. I very much appreciated all the um, data that you guys have compiled and presented. Um, uh, I wanted to go back and ask, uh, um, because I was surprised about the that there is no uh, expiration date on the vial, and so that a clinic is going to have to go to these this website to check each and every vial to find out about the website. And I worry about um, the feasibility of doing that and the potential for error. Is this something that's done for other vaccines? I'm not familiar with this approach. Thank you. Okay, I can take that one. Um, you know, I don't really think it's um, typical. We are used to seeing the expiration on the vial or the carton. Um, this has um, 
come up, I think, with some uh, uh, a QR code rather than having the date. Um, that's been an example, um, and I, I can't recall exactly which um, COVID-19 vaccine offhand, but um, I will mention that uh, CDC does have a um, COVID-19 vaccine expiration date tracker to help aid in this. I know, of course, it is not as ideal as having the expiration on the vial, um, but that is available with our clinical education materials so that uh, providers can look up the expiration in lots and write that down um, and also suggest, of course, noting it on the carton immediately uh, to help prevent vaccine administration errors. Uh, but I, I would say, of course, this is certainly a higher risk for administering uh, expired vaccine. Um, and I don't know if Novavax would like to comment at all about the label or um, the reason for not including the expiration date. Yeah, this is Philip. The, the, the reason why it was strictly a logistic one and we are, we're working uh, toward providing labeling, which is more complete. Um, I'm going to ask just a really quick follow-up question to our FDA colleagues. Um, I, you know, typically I, I think with a BLA, this type of labeling is reviewed in advance of approval of a BLA. Is there similar sort of guidance or requirements for labeling um, and for consistency across um, vaccines that are under an EUA? And I ask because this, um, you know, Dr. Paling brings up this issue today, but it just feels like the last few presentations is just getting um, overly complex. Um, not the presentation, sorry. The last few sort of vaccine approvals have gotten overly complex. And I'm wondering if um, this is an opportunity for improvement uh, or if this is something that's already um, in the works at FDA. Hey, this is this is Becca Reindell from FDA. Um, just to clarify, the question is: Are 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 changes to our labeling regulations planned to address the complexity that that the COVID pandemic has introduced in terms of how we approach these vaccines? Yes, I mean part of it is that, but part of it is also just you know some labels lately have not had the dose on it. Some labels don't have the expiration date. So I'm just wondering if this is a byproduct of um, having to go through, um, you know, an EUA process for these vaccines. Um, and I don't, I just don't recall this for vaccines that are typically approved under a BLA. Uh, okay, I can, I can, I can double check on the specifics of each vaccine label or fact sheet to see what informed, you know, why information was or was not included. There may be specific considerations that inform that, that would be sort of on a case by case basis. But I can, I, you know, the concern is acknowledged and I can, I can bring it back in terms of uh, working on labeling to make it more uh, consistent. And, and still, you know, within the bounds of, of the regulations and what each specific fact sheet or uh, label requires. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, Dr. Cotton? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm appreciative that immunocompromised patients were included in the clinical guidance. However, based on pretty much all other vaccine data in immunocompromised patients, we would suspect that these patients would need more than two doses of vaccine to engender significant protection. And I know that for now, uh, the company did not include immunocompromised patients other than a very small subset of people living with HIV in their clinical trials. And it's unlikely that we're going to have that data for a while. So it's just disappointing that this 3%, estimated 3% of the US population that the vulnerable to severe life-threatening disease now have an option for a vaccine, but it's probably um, based on other data, we would think that it's likely to be less than uh, fully protective. So they're kind of left in a um, situation where for the near foreseeable future, there won't be data that will guide our ability to um, make a better decision for that population. So. 
I'd just like to express that I'm um, disappointed at um, the situation for this new vaccine, which will be uh, good for some um, immunocompromised patients for sure, uh, but that we probably are not able to make a better um, vaccine uh, decision. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, I have a few comments. So we didn't hear much about allergic reactions uh, from the Novavax um, person um, in terms of the allergic, um, in terms of um, adverse uh, reactions. And then we heard about the angioedema that was possibly, that was um, related. Um, my, I guess my comment is, first of all, um, if the Novavax people are on the call still, and if they can comment on allergic reactions, and in the clinical considerations, um, did not hear about having to monitor and keep individuals who've received Novavax for the 15 minutes or so um, after it's received. And it's still that's something that needs to, that will be followed. That's one question I'll wait there. I still have a few. <laughs> Do we have colleagues on from Novavax that can respond? I don't know if Dr. Dubofsky stepped away for a second, but I, I think what he may have shown in the presentation is that there were no cases of anaphylaxis reported right. during the clinical development. So that's during the, the, the studies that we described. In the post-marketing um, authorization, we received a couple of reports of anaphylaxis. And so our, our label, for example, in the European Union was recently modified to, to reflect that, you know, class labeling effect. I can speak a little bit more about allergic reactions as well. This is Denny Kim. I'm, I'm the chief safety officer. The, um, so we did look broadly at possible allergic reactions and, uh, and particularly hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, there's a standard measure query that we can utilize. Um, there was a uh, there, there was a 0.77% when you utilize this very broad search there was a 0.77% incidence in Novavax and a 0.57% incidence in placebo arm. Um, they, they were non-serious and the most frequent PTs were rash, urticaria, and dermatitis, uh, contact dermatitis. And as uh, Dr. Mallory mentioned, there were no events of anaphylaxis reported in our clinical program. And um, so for that case, that singular case of angioedema, there were sort of multiple confounding factors that were reported uh, for that particular case. There are no other similar events observed in the clinical program or across the adjuvant program. And this event uh, occurred about five days after the first dose and resolved on the same day. There was no respiratory dis distress, distress. And it was also sort of co confounded by concomitant antibiotic use as well as, as well as concurrent infection and a history of penicillin allergy. Um, so that uh, we, we do feel that there are some significant confounders to that particular case of angioedema. So really, um, it sounds like nothing, at least in the limited um, experience in those 15 minutes that people are being watched. Sounds like most of them were later. That's correct. And, um, and I can answer the question about the um, CDC's guidance for the observation periods. Um, this has not changed. Uh, there's some minor tweaks in the language, but the meaning has not changed. Uh, the 30 minutes is still recommended for those with a history of anaphylaxis due to any cause, history of an immediate allergic reaction of any severity to non-COVID-19 vaccines or injectable therapies, history of non-severe immediate allergic reaction after a previous dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and also people with a contraindication to a different type of COVID-19 vaccine that have a precaution to this one, and for all other people, 15 minutes. Thank you. you. Did you have another question, Dr. Sanchez? I have a question. Um, so the mix and matching of the, you know, the vaccine doses, um, I understand that you know, it's not recommended that the primary series should be the same. But what it, but in all honesty, 
there are some places that only give one one type. So what if um, the Novavax is given once and they come in and the only available one is one of the messenger RNA vaccines? Um, the Novavax vaccine is not um, approved for booster dosing, but if they do get a, one messenger RNA, one Novavax, should there be a booster dose of the messenger RNA afterwards? It, was that discussed? I'm, I may have missed it. I think that's to Dr. Twentyman. Thanks so much. I will um, say that we do, I think the, the fundamental principle is that we do recommend homologous primary series. Um, if a mixed primary series is inadvertently administered, we do consider that series complete, uh, those doses don't have to be repeated. It is considered an error though. Um, I, I guess, yeah, my question then would be, would that person fall under the Novavax or the messenger RNA and whether that person should receive a booster of the messenger RNA? Um, you don't have to answer now. I think it needs to be in the commented in the clinic. No, well, I, was, I, I was actually just thinking as a physician, I would probably try to figure out why they started with Novavax um, because the mRNA vaccines have been around and in, and in supply. If they had intended to complete an mRNA primary series, I don't know why they couldn't complete an mRNA primary series. Um, and I would certainly defer to Dr. Holler or my other colleagues um, to offer any contraindications there. Um, if they had not intended um, to receive an mRNA vaccine at any point, and that was why they were beginning a Novavax series, I, I doubt that they would want to proceed with another mRNA dose, although perhaps they would um, be convinced of the safety of these vaccines after that uh, experience. Um, thank you for your, your great question. Others to weigh in? Madam Chair, Dr. Dr. Oh, Ramirez. yes, Dr. Romero, go ahead. Yeah, may I address the, the committee? So um, the ACIP will, will uh, CDC will, will issue uh, write a statement on this and recommendations in upcoming clinical guidance. Um, Thank you. Uh, did I'll you wait. have another I'll question, wait. Dr. Sanchez? <laughs> I'll wait. I'll wait after that. Okay, it sounds like there'll be clarifications forthcoming and the clinical considerations um, for the various permutations, but um, we'll still be confined, presumably, to uh, the EUA, but I understand what your question is. So um, we'll defer to the team to provide some additional guidance on that. Another question, Dr. Sanchez, or should we move on to Dr. Daly? Well, I do have one. Um, and just a comment. Um, I was kind of disappointed about the myocarditis um, data um, because you know, um, we uh, of a lot and appropriately has been said with the messenger RNA vaccine, and yet when the rates that we're seeing certainly not as large, um, not as large numbers. Um, the I'm trying to find the slide there. Um, it was, you know, it's they're still substantial. And um, which, you know, we discussed earlier the importance of looking or of the mechanisms. And it may just be all this, this um, spike protein that just doesn't like our bodies. Uh, but um, can you, is there any, um, anyway, I'm, I'm just disappointed at it and um, it seems like the myocarditis um, seemed to be occur equally between males and females, and I was wondering if there was any more um, to that effect. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, thank you for your excellent question. Uh, we take any and every safety signal extremely, extremely seriously, including this one. Uh, I think the numbers that we have seen of myocarditis and or pericarditis in clinical trials and in uh, post-marketing data globally are small. Um, I don't know that we 
can even say what the balance between males and females would be yet. I don't know that we have this risk very well characterized. And I know that we don't have the data to the point where we feel confident we can compare the risk between mRNA and Novavax COVID-19 vaccines. However, I will just say two things. One, this further underscores the importance of the intensive vaccine safety surveillance efforts that we have ongoing through VAERS and BSD and uh, the work that supports those um, and other safety platforms. And then two, I think we've learned a lot about the risk that COVID-19 disease itself poses to the human heart. And uh, we have learned that um, these vaccines uh, are protective um, against those cardiac uh, risks, even among the risk, the, the groups that we know to be at higher risk of these rare cardiac complications after mRNA vaccines. So I think we have a lot more to learn. I think we are gonna be looking at that closely. And in the meantime, we would encourage uh, everyone to complete a primary series vaccination and then get up to date. Thank you for raising. No, I, I agree, I agree. Um, and, but, um, and then my other comment was, um, I presume that this, the NOVAX, if approved today, or if approved by CDC, um, it will be added to be safe. It will be showing up soon. Uh, Dr. Shimabukuro, are you on? Yes. Could you could you repeat that question again, please? The question is whether or not um, VSafe will incorporate a Novavax vaccine. Is there an opportunity to continue to um, leverage VSafe for safety surveillance? Yes. Um, I mean it, that all, all, any any of the COVID vaccines that are available. Um, are, 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 can be included in VSafe, and we'll use a, a, a similar survey. Um, are we ready to go ahead? Yes, I think we can proceed, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we, now I've seem to have lost the slide. There we go. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Twentyman, would you be willing to read the um, proposed vote language on the slide for us? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. The proposed vote language is as follows. A two-dose Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted is recommended as a COVID-19 vaccine primary series for persons ages 18 years and older under the emergency use authorization issued by FDA. Thank you. Are there any questions or clarifications that members would like to make about this particular vote language? Dr. Long. Yes, it's it's not a clarification that needs any word change here. This looks straightforward, but it, it's a plea that we hold the manufacturer to the fire to have an expiration date on the label. And I, I think it, is it. I think I heard um, Philip Dubovsky say that this will happen, but. I have had lots of uh, feedback about the previous two, two previous immunizations that we have recommended that had the wrong volume, the wrong age, having to understand the border, whether that's maroon or whatever, brown or whatever color it is. This is just not acceptable, right? We're, 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 we're cutting off a, a step. And in this case, with the probability that maybe 12 or at the most 15% of the 10% who are not immunized might choose this vaccine, there is no rush to have it there without proper labeling that minimizes the risk of errors. So I'm surprised that the FDA would authorize a, a drug, a product, a vaccine without an expiration date. And I don't think that we should recommend it without expiration dates right on the vial. It's not acceptable to ask the poor, overworked, under-resourced uh, administrators to go find a website and look it up for the particular vial in their hand. We teach them. You look at the vial, you see if you've got the right age. You look at, you see what, what the volume is you're going to administer. You look at the uh, expiration date, you do all those things before you get the baby held down to drop and give the shot. So 
we're losing credibility with uh, the people who have to administer these vaccines. So I would like somehow that caveat to be understood um, to push that to happen before this vaccine is um, provided for the United States population. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Dr. Freihofer. Uh, yes, um, Sandra Freyhofer, uh, American Medical Association, speaking as a practicing physician, uh, I greatly understand those last comments, but let me explain that when my office had Moderna vaccine to administer, they were changing and increasing the expiration date um, <laughs> at unscheduled times, and we administered the vaccine, we received it late, we received it uh, we thought on the last day that it could be administered. And then it turned out that they had extended the expiration date. So this um, moving expiration date sort of thing is not new, but I agree it is very confusing. But what's even more confusing to me is when they don't put the concentration of the vaccine on the vial. Yeah, thank you for those comments. I do think just from an implementation standpoint, uh, you know, having a standard approach to how we do this uh, and consistency across vaccine products would greatly ease implementation and barriers to, you know, access, to be frank, because I think everyone's worried about uh, making errors. Um, uh, and so we just want to make sure that we are making it easier for people to do the right thing, bottom line. Um, Dr. Lair. Uh, thank you. I'd like to make a motion to bring this a motion that's in front of us, the interim recommendation for a vote. Thank you. It's been moved that we accept the proposed vote language on the slide. Do I have a second, Dr. Paling? I will second that motion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. So it's been moved and seconded that we um, accept the vote language that's written on the slide here. Um, I'm going to ask if there's any other questions or clarifications that the members would like prior to moving on to a vote. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. So I'll ask my uh, ACIP voting members if they will please turn on their camera. I see some of my members, hopefully I'll see more, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I see a few more. I can't see the entire screen. So we'll get, go ahead and get started. So um, the current vote language is a two-dose Novavax COVID-19 vaccine. Adjuvanted is recommended as a COVID-19 vaccine primary series for persons ages 18 years and older under the EUA issued by the FDA. As a reminder, I'll ask you to um, state your name, um, whether you have any conflicts of interest in your vote. Uh, so we will start with the people I can see on my screen. We'll start with Dr. Palin. Kathy Paling, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Sineas. Dr. Sineas, uh, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Long. Sarah Long, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Dr. Talbot, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Lair? Jamie Lair, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? Camille Cotton, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Chen? Wilbur Chen, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Ms. Bata? Lynn Bata, no conflict, yes. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Uh, Matt Daly, no conflicts, yes. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Pablo Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Thank you, and Grace Lee, no conflicts, yes. Uh, Dr. Wharton, this uh, vote passes with 12 yeses and zero noes. Can you tell me if my count is right? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee, that's what I got as well. Okay, perfect. Um, I want to thank my uh, voting members uh, for asking.
asking these questions today and our uh, presenters for uh, presenting all this information. Uh, before we move on, I just I typically ask if any voting members would like to make any comments. If so, please raise your hand. It is not required, but I did want to offer that opportunity. Dr. Talbot. Yes, I just wanted to reiterate what Dr. Long said. I think um, we've been moving at warp speed. <laughs> as the Operation Warp Speed name has said, to make sure that vaccines are available for everyone. But I think we will continue to need to stop and look back and say, what can we do better? And I think the labeling is one of them. And I think that's just a process. And hopefully by the time we're talking about booster doses and immunocompromised doses for this vaccine, um, labels will be updated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Dr. Cotton? I'd like to state two things. One, I would hope that there could be some kind of anticipated timeline for booster doses for the late summer and fall. Um, some people are asking whether they should be getting booster doses now when they are due or if they should wait. I'm worried about that approach with BA5. And I think if there were some kind of uh, rough timeline that people could use for clinical decision making, that would be useful for both clinicians as well as for uh, vaccine recipients. And I would also encourage uh, further discussion on these calls about the monkeypox vaccine. That is a very active vaccine rollout. And as much information as we could have would be really helpful. The um, discussion, the presentations that happened at the last meeting were really useful and very welcomed by my colleagues. So thank you for those presentations and let's con continue uh, to disseminate as much information about monkeypox vaccines as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Dr. Brooks? Yes, I'd just like to note that the primary target population for Novavax will be the 10 to 13% of those that are unvaccinated. That is more or less the only indication right now. So understand that we really need to focus on that population and with the hope that perhaps this protein subunit vaccine will change them over to being Unvac from being unvaccinated to vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. I don't see any additional hands raised. So I, um, oh, Dr. Long, please go ahead. Yeah, well, we didn't go away because <laughs> what everybody wanted us to discuss today, this, this vaccine, I don't take away that it's wonderful to have a, yet a fourth vaccine. But what everybody wanted us to discuss, because the White House is kind of getting out in front of it, is more booster doses, the merit of waiting. Um, when might we see an Omicron uh, optimized vaccine? Will we see that for children? Should we wait for this such this thing to happen? So we didn't uh, understand, Grace, that anybody provided you or us with any kind of ideas of this timeline? Um, thank you. Uh, I see two more hands raised. Um, I think what I'll do is maybe I'll um, ask if either Dr. Wharton or Dr. Romero in the room at the end can provide some overarching comments, um, given that I, you know, our work is not done clearly. Um, although we were able to approve this uh, fourth vaccine candidate today, we obviously still have work ahead uh, and probably for the fall and uh, perhaps sooner than the fall. Dr. Cotton? I'd like to take this opportunity to just reiterate the importance of additional methods of prevention. We talk a lot about vaccines for immunocompromised, but we do not mention monoclonal antibodies that can be used for prevention, such as Evusheld. And so far, a tiny minority of immunocompromised patients who would qualify for Evusheld have received even a first dose. There's now a recommendation for a second dose six months after the first dose. And as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, I think it would be key to mention all, all methods of prevention, um, whether they be infection control, vaccines, or monoclonal antibodies. For clinicians listening, for um, patients and families who are, um, for patients who are immunocompromised and their family members, uh, please strongly consider Evusheld. It is effective. Um, in the setting of BA5, and I have seen it be a significant uh, game changer in combination with uh, a full vaccine series for immunocompromised. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patton. Dr. Sanchez? 
Well, thank you. And um, first of all, I, I'm really positive about this vaccine. I'm really, um, you know, having a fourth one. I think that following a traditional platform, I'm hoping that it will, um, you know, will, um, you know, um, direct, it can be directed at people with vaccine hesitancy, especially um, what I hear that this is not um, made out of fetal, um, aborted fetal tissue. I think that there is a large population there that has voiced that as, as, as a major concern. So I think that that will eliminate some of that reasoning and some of that pushback. So I think that's great. I also do want to say that we do need the public, we physicians need some guidance about the fall, about waiting. When are these, you know, we keep hearing about these, um, you know, these combined vaccines with different variants. We, should we wait? We can't be boosting every three months. Um, we really need some guidance. And along with that, I think there is an, there will be an urgency for those who do receive the Novavax vaccine to have um, some FDA comment also on, on the booster dosing. And I know that that is being presented and they're working on that, but I do think that that's gonna be um, another issue that's gonna come up that we do need, that there will be some urgency in, in terms of those individuals who do receive it. I'm, I'm concerned that they may, um, there may be more heterologous boosting later as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Dr. Cotton? I'd just like to second what Pablo said and add that people feel that they may be penalized if they get a booster now in the setting of raging BA5 subvariant disease in that they think that their next booster may need to be significantly delayed. So increased transparency there would really help and I think could really decrease uh, the level of disease we're seeing now if people had more information about boosters now versus boosters later. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paling? Did you raise your hand? Apologies. Uh, oh, no, I did raise my hand. I took it down, but I, but, um, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, um, through the pandemic, we have learned a lot and our knowledge has evolved. And our knowledge at this point is that three doses of vaccine is um, really important. And I wanted just to highlight that. And because, and that's a lot of what Dr. Sanchez, uh, Dr. Hutton and others are talking about because we do know you've got to get a complete vaccine and this is a huge opportunity across the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Yes, so I think we also have to remember that because of poverty issues and when we look at our homeless populations, it is very difficult to be giving injections or getting to have a high compliance with treatment every three to four months. So I believe it will be very critical for us to know about a new booster for the variant, uh, Omicron variant specimens, because uh, with vaccine hesitancy, it is difficult for a lot of Blacks to think that they have to get an injection every three to four months, let alone a huge access issue to providers uh, and because of the social determinants, especially as the weather gets greater in terms of cultural climate issues or coal and what have you. So this is just really critical, I think, in terms of our messaging uh, that we put out there for uh, people of color and uh, different racial and ethnic groups. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, ask if my colleagues in the room, uh, Dr. Wharton and Dr. Romero, uh, would like to make any uh, closing comments and if possible to look ahead uh, and read the crystal ball uh, for what our next future meetings will hold. Um, Dr. Wharton, Dr. Romero. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, this is Dr. Wharton. So uh, we really appreciate the committee's engagement on this issue today. Um, this has been an extraordinary couple of years. And, um, and I know we've made unprecedented demands on our committee to repeatedly engage as recommendations have, or as, as 
those recommendations have incrementally expanded for a, uh, a number of vaccines that are, have been uh, initially authorized by the Food and Drug Administration under emergency use authorization. It, it has been, um, a, a, again, a really extraordinary set of demands, and we're very grateful for the committee's support in um, helping and in advising the agency on appropriate use of these products. We, we are expecting that there will be uh, boosters in the fall. Um, you know, what the time frame will be for that uh, is, is not completely clear yet. But as we get more information, as things move forward, we will look forward to um, uh, sharing additional information with the work group as it becomes available and bringing that to the committee um, when we've got uh, actual questions for deliberation. So we really appreciate um, your ongoing engagement with this. Dr. Romero, do you want to say anything else? Thank you, Dr. Wharton. No, nothing more than to thank you all for your efforts uh, and um, please get some rest. Thank you. Apologies, thank you. Uh, I was muted. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to ask if there's any objections to adjourning today's meeting. Dr. Long, I see you raised your hand. Did you want to make one last comment before we adjourn? Yeah, it's 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 to push Dr. Wharton and Dr. Romero a little bit more. Boosters in the fall. Well, you know, the fall, most people are thinking about getting their their people immunized around August and September. Are you talking about likely to have optimized boosters in the fall. And in that situation, you know, they're elderly people. I'm in that elderly group now, as are, you know, millions of Americans. And we are six months past our second booster. And we see the hospitalization rates in this age group going up. So what is your assessment for the best care in the next month or two, I don't know what you consider fall, and are you saying that we will be considering an optimized booster or considering whether we wanna give the same vaccines that we've given, in fact, in more booster doses or for different age groups or for younger people with no underlying conditions? Can you just specify that a little bit more so we know what to tell everybody? Uh, well, I'm going to jump in here, Dr. Long, um, and just say that I think that as soon as there are um, there's additional information available and uh, appropriate authorization or approval from the FDA, um, I anticipate we as a committee will be um, meeting to discuss that very issue. Um, so without being able to uh, predict the future, I do think um, what you're asking and what everyone is asking for is additional guidance. I think we are going to be asking ourselves that question as a committee. And so I look to you and to this committee for us to be able to uh, bring this forward to the public um, with additional data, with additional guidance, and with additional discussion. Um, I don't want to put Dr. Romero and Dr. Wharton in the position today of having to uh, predict when exactly that will be, since we do not know when that data will become available. But um, I think with that, I would like to go ahead and suggest that we um, adjourn today's meeting Dr. Long, we, you will get your wish. We will meet soon enough and maybe sooner than you hope. <laughs> um, so uh, I promise, you, yes, we'll, we'll come back and talk about it. I just can't predict when. Um, any other business or any uh, other objections to adjourning today's meeting? Okay, hearing none, um, I am going to uh, uh, knock my gavel and say thank you everyone for all your presentations and your uh, time today for another emergency meeting. Uh, although I hope we don't have to meet again for another emergency meeting, I anticipate it'll, it'll become uh, sooner, it comes sooner rather than later as Dr. Long has highlighted, and we'll be talking again soon. So today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned. Thank you everyone.